fish are friends, not food. I'm a little worried about Rob. Yes, yes, it's happening. Ever since we tried to summon Cthulhu, he just, he hasn't been the same. I'm growing gills, gills. My transformation into a deep one has finally begun. Rob, we don't see any gills. It's these kids getting involved all the stuff causes them to go. I think I feel the webbing starting to grow between my fingers. Welcome to Dinner and a Board Game, a new actual play show about friends, good food, and lots of fun at the gaming table. We're your hosts, Megan and Heath. Each night, I'll invite the gaming group over to my house to cook dinner, sample drinks, and play a board game on one of our customized board game boards. Dinner and a Board Game is an actual play show where you'll be able to watch the game from start to finish with gameplay dashboards and graphics that help track the turns and allow everyone to follow the game's action. We'll play games like Zombicide, Black Plague, Descent, Journeys in the Dark, Small World, Unearthed, and Terraforming Mars. We'll even be joined by special guests such as Lou Anders, J.F. Lewis, and cosmic horror artist David LaRocca. The show is free to watch on YouTube. Just come by my channel, Heath Robinson, and be sure to subscribe. Click Watch Now to start the first episode and join us for fun-filled evenings of dinner and a board game. And now it's time for Table Talk, where we'll be talking about the creative and business side of making things in the tabletop and fantasy genre. Let's get to it. Hello, everyone. Welcome to tonight's episode of Table Talk. I have a very special guest with us tonight. His name is Chuck Bush, and he's been incredibly influential in my journey in all of the creative the types of things that I've been doing, but especially in film and film production, I guarantee you that I would not have done The Cultists, which, you know, we've shot the season, second season, that's going to be coming out soon, uh, or Dinner and a Board Game, if I hadn't attended Chuck Bush's workshops when he was uh, running some workshops about 30 minutes away from my house on how to make films and how to actually make that work. So he is an incredibly important person to talk to with regard to both the creative side of making things, because that's what we talk about here on the show, both the creative and business side of trying to make what you want as a creative individual. So he's got a lot of talent in the creative side of things, but then also a lot of knowledge in the business side of things and how to actually make it uh, make make things happen. So I'm going to bring him on right now. Welcome, Chuck. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure, man. <laughs> so would you like to introduce yourself in the context oh. of film and TV and being a creative person and let everybody know what you've been involved in, what you've done and what you're doing now? Wow. Yeah, sure, man. I'll, I'll take a run at it because, you know, talking about myself is my favorite sport. But um, hi, I'm Chuck Bush and I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> Oh, wait a minute. That's the wrong place. I'm sorry. Um, I've been uh, I've been blessed enough to be making films since 1983 uh, with a film called Fandango with a guy you probably never heard of named Kevin Costner. But since then, uh, I've done, oh, gosh, I don't know, 12, 15 films and several TV series. Um, just finished writing the the fifth screenplay that I've been commissioned to write. Uh, and working with another film on putting their their budget together for them and their schedule breakdown. So that, that's the kind of stuff I've been doing since 1983. Be, I'll celebrate 40 years in this business in April of next year. Oh, wow. Okay. All right. So we've got, uh, like I said, we've got two different elements here, the business and the creative side of making yeah. things. And, the, that's and right. I think that most of what we have to talk about is probably about the business side of how to get things done. If you're a creative, and you've got ideas and how do you actually make it happen. But I want to start with a question about the creative side of things, because I pulled this off of your Instagram because you were involved in a production uh, that involved constructing a historical Jerusalem. Okay, so let me bring this up here because I've got this picture here. Yeah. <laughs> in, 
in so many ways, I think that a lot of people who would be listening to this or who would be on the uh, the other channels would uh, like in, this is kind of a dream here. I mean, when I saw this, I was like, oh, wow, this huge environment being able to construct this set that's like a historic Jerusalem, whether people are trying to, to replicate a historic environment like you were here or whether they've got, you know, a fantasy city that they're trying to, to construct for, you know, their own show or something like that. Right. How did you? How did this come about? What, how did how were you able to do this? Wow. Well, you know what we we were very fortunate. Uh, the gentleman I did this picture with was a fellow named Frank Schroeder. Frank was the producer uh, and uh, actually the director and executive producer of a film called The Pistol about Pistol Pete Maravich. And Frank uh, and some partners bought a first century set from Sibley, Louisiana, that was used to make the film year one with Jack Black. And so we were, we, we were looking at doing a feature film using, and in, in, in this film as well, even though there's practical set, we also used Unreal Engine, uh, real, real time compositing to composite, because you can see it's just three buildings. We, we wrapped green screen around this and then real time composited the rest of the city behind this. And we, this is a proof of concept film called The Narrow Path. Uh, it's won so far 21 film festival awards, including best visual effects. And um, so here, this is the set of year one. Those are real stone pavers on the ground that we put on top of plywood, which you can see to the far right over here, you can see cans of paint on some of the plywood. And right by the lady's feet there, you see plywood there. And um, this is all styrofoam. That's all styrofoam. The buildings are made of styrofoam. We had a, an amazing uh, scenic painter artist, uh, kind of our production designer named Matt Whittle. And you, there's no way. I mean, you can put your eyeballs right up on that. It'll still look like like blocks and not styrofoam. It's a great job. And uh, we made this in 2022 with uh, 100 extras <laughs> in the middle of COVID in wow. 2020. So um, that's uh, that's what this is. So the film's called Narrow Path, and uh, it's it's going to be out uh, probably I would think spring of next year because it's run through the festival circuit now. And uh, so that's that. But this is inside of a gym. In a it looks like stage. a gym. Yeah, yeah it's a gym. It's not a soundstage, um, and it had all of its all the challenges of being a gym. Because you know the, the uh, electrical, the electrical rather uh, issues of you know having to plug straight into three phase power and having to bring in our own power distribution and those kind of things. But you know I'm very, very, very blessed to have been working with some of the same uh, artisans. My uh, director of photography for ten years, uh, my my uh, gaffer for twenty years, and they just came in and helped us make this happen. How long did it take to construct this physical set? This physical set was done on a volunteer basis, which I'm sure some of your viewers would like to know. And it took about it took about a month. It took about a month because of all the prep work we had to do. I mean that we had to, you know, clean the gym floor and because we didn't want to put plywood down on the floor on top of dirt, it would just scratch it up. So we had to clean the gym floor and then put the boards down, lay it out. We meet, we had draftsmen, we had uh, graphic designers, we had, <coughs> excuse me, a team of, I don't know, probably uh, 40, 50 people working in different aspects of getting it put up and getting it settled. Um, you know, and, and that's, that's, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. I'm so just 40, 40 to 50 to people out. over a month to create this. Yeah, well, it took, it, it, we probably had 10 people on the um and you know sometimes as many as 20 but it, it, it you know um at one time at one time and it took a, it took about a month to put it all together yeah wow yep well like i said when i see that and i think about like constructing i, mean, I know so many people who would want to be able to build out either historical or fantasy sets like that sure. and it just seems like the dream to be able to do it and so yep. and so you have actually made it happen that that is incredible well, we, it was a team effort man it was a team effort we you know we had a lot of uh, a lot of great people working on the show and and we shot the we shot the whole show in four days three and a half days really and um, and then we had a ton a ton of visual effects work 
It's a 15 minute film. We had 70 visual effects shots. Because it's actually the siege of Jerusalem. It depicts the siege of Jerusalem. That is correct. It, yeah. it, not only the siege, but it, it's the day that the Romans break through uh, and kill all kind of people. <laughs> so yeah, and uh, all the, all the fire that we did in here, we couldn't burn anything in here. So all the fire is computer generated. All the buildings burning, computer generated. The smoke, it's all computer generated. So uh, 40 to 50 people overall, 10 to 20 people there at a time, one month to build, and you said shot in four days. Yes. Shot for four days worth of actual shooting. Yep. And another, Very cool. Another three, four days tearing it down because we had to be delicate. Okay. Well, then let's let's go on to sort of the the actual the business side of how to make things happen. Sure. And one of the questions that I thought was funny that came up when I was talking to some of the cast and crew of the cultists after you know some of our shoots and stuff like that, we were just hanging around. Is some people were wondering, or some people had, or people commented like. I wouldn't want to be a producer. Like, why would you even want to be a producer? They want to be the actors. They want to be the directors, or right. the director of photography. But I was the only one there who had this interest in being in the producer. So right. why be the producer? And what does that mean in order to get something like this off the ground? Wow. Okay. Well, um, wh let me answer the first question. Why be a producer? Uh, if you have a story that you want told... There has to be a producer. So either you have to go convince someone to be your producer or you have to. I became I became a producer because I knew I was the only producer who knew that I was a great director. So that's that's why I did that. Um, and, it, you know, it all starts with the story. You know, what's the story? What story are you telling? Are you passionate about the story? Because, you know, from firsthand experience, if you're not passionate about your subject, you might as well go home. Because anytime, you know, I've, I've made films for as little as $32,000. I shouldn't say I made them. I was part of films for as little as $32,000 and part of films as high as $14.8 And these things are true. There's never enough time and there's never enough money. I don't care what you're doing. So, so you have to be passionate about it because if you're shooting six days a week for six weeks, it's exhausting. As a producer or director, you're the first person on set in the morning and you're the last person to leave. The only way you get through that is passion. The only way to raise money is passion. The only way to push through it and get things made is, is passion because making films, making television, it's war. It's war. So you got to be passionate. You got to lead the troops and, and get things done. Well, I think so in order to make it happen. Yes. Like that's the reason to be the producer right there. I mean, that's how I kind of got into it is I was like, Hey, I've got this idea, but if there's not a producer, it's not going to get done. So yeah. if you want to get it done, then you may have to step into that role. And that's the person who's actually going to make it happen. Sure. Well, you know, producers come in many flavors. There are people who are creative producers and they find a story and they're passionate about the story. And so they, they, try to uh, enlist other people, directors or cast or crew. And then there are, but they don't, any, they don't want anything to do with the mechanics of the production. They just have a creative vision and they want to have, uh, you know, creative control. Then you have someone who's like a line producer and their whole job is the nuts and bolts of the day-to-day -day getting it done, dealing with the contracts to make sure the actor's contracts are correct and, and lived up to, making sure that, uh, you know, people are hired, making sure that uh, there there's toilet paper in the porta pot. I mean, they're, 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 all that stuff takes a mechanism, and that's what a line producer does. And then, of course, you have an executive producer who's typically the person who is um, – they're accountable to the investors for the money, really, at the end of the day. The executive producer is the guy who gets in there and says, hey, this is how your money's being spent. This is why we're doing it this way. And, you know, I know the schedule looks like we're two days over or over schedule, but we're going to work that out because we're going to fix this, this and this. And, and it makes everybody happy and OK. Mm -hmm. So you have the creative guys who are strictly creative. You have the, the business guys who are strictly business and then kind of the cross business technical guys who who like to do it all. Well, I was talking to uh, another individual uh, over lunch one day who was talking about trying to get films together because he was also trying to get this. But he and I, it was a really interesting conversation because he and I were kind of very different in this approach. Because when I think about trying to make something 
whether it's been the cultists or dinner and board game and all of that. I mean, it's definitely kind of in the trenches about how to make it, how to get it yeah. done. But when he was talking about things, because I was like, you know, he's trying to make this, this, you know, action adventure kind of movies and trying to make all these things happen. And I was like, well, you know, who's going to make the suits of armor and the, this and how are you? And he was like, I don't know, because he was operating at a higher level than that. He was really trying to bring together. I got this IP. I want to have it, make it happen with this actor. And right. he's really trying to connect things at a really high level. And like who makes the costumes is really not something he was even like no. he was going to hire somebody to do that. Like, yeah, that, that's what you got to do. You got to delegate. You got to do a good job of delegating. And that's that's probably you know where they were at. Yeah, there there are no shortage of things you can find yourself doing if you're making a film, and you really have to be a strong-willed individual to make things good. I, I mean, I I was a line producer on a film, and when the film would wrap, we'd look at what was shot that day, and then I'd go to Sam's and buy all the craft services for the next day. And I'm getting I'm getting in at two o'clock in the morning, having to be on set for eight o'clock, and that didn't work out good for very long. You can't do that very long. No. You cannot do that very no. long. Yeah. So, but you know, again, you have to either be able to raise the money or do the work. One of the two. You, 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 if you can't raise enough money, then you have to wear multiple hats. But if you put a proper budget together and be disciplined enough to hold to that budget until you've raised all your money, not try to just say, hey, we got half the money, we can shoot the movie, let's go shoot it. But we're about editing later. You can't do that. That gets you in trouble more times than not. So figure a good, solid budget. Don't skimp. Don't think, well, you know, I can, I can do this or do that. You know, if I have to be the craft services guy, if I have to be the editor, if I have to be, that's fine. No, raise all the money you want to raise and don't start. Be disciplined enough to not start until you raised all your money. Because you got to either got to pay for it or you got to have experience and do it. Okay, then let's say, Let's say you have an idea in today's world. Okay. And I've talked about this with diff with people who are from the the you know the the traditional publishing novel writing and also game publishing. And now here we're talking about film or TV. You got this idea that you want to exist, and they th say there are basically two routes you can go. You can try to go a traditional studio route, or you can try to go an independent route. All right. How do you know when you're sitting there with your idea which route is right? And then what do you need to prep in order to go in either direction? Like sure. Well, I, if I may, I'd like to expand that a little bit more. Okay. Okay. Uh, simply because, I, as you know, I'm, an, I'm a published author. And yeah. so, you know, if you have a story to tell, the first thing you really have to do is dig deep and say, okay, what is the best means of getting my baby into the world? What is the best way to do this? Is it... Um, through a book? Is it through a graphic novel series? Is it through a movie? You know, um, there's a there's an old joke that says, you know, how many producers does it take to change a light bulb? Answer, does it have to be a light bulb? <laughs> That's the, so, so, you know, it, it can be, now if you say, okay, and so now you, you decide, you know, I think the world needs to experience my product, my story through film. You know, the difference between a book and a film, just briefly here, a book, I mean, obviously it has pages, guys. I, I know that. So does a screenplay. So what? But a book is is played out in the theater of your mind. Uh, a stage play is played out on a stage over there. A film takes you into the story. You are part of the story, uh, which is why they have close-ups and wide angles and those all those different angles. So... If, if, you, if you have the kind of story that you think would be best told in somebody's thoughts and, and have a sphere of like, like your, your um, series, your, your different uh, games and things, that has a very, uh, I think it lends itself to fantasy in terms of people putting their thoughts into what else is going on on your game table. So in that case, maybe a book is the best thing because they can, they can impose their mind into the book, into the story. Whereas in a film, it's right there in front of you. You can't really add to it. You can't take away from it. All you can do is, is resonate with it or not. And so the, the process of deciding how it should come to an audience really should be determined by what you think is the best. Because these are, these are your story is like your child. What is the best way to present your child to the world? Is it 
in the written word? Is it in a, is it a movie, in, a, in a, a, a short series documentary? I mean, all these different things are you know, ways, of, ways of telling stories. You have to decide what's best for your baby. And that's, that's what you do. It just takes time and contemplation. Uh, what, what I was bringing up, I wanted to share that a lot of, uh, we're going to talk about the business and the creative side, and we're talking about the creative side will be here on this channel, but that I also do run, let everybody know that I run a secondary channel called Heath's Business for Creatives. So right. we're talking about the business side of all of this. Uh, that is another channel that I've got uh, that has uh, about 130 videos right now on all the lessons that I've learned about uh, trying to make things happen uh, from a creative perspective. And so some of what we're talking about here may be cropped and go to that channel just to let everybody know that that may be the case. And, and look, uh, that's a, that's a, what a valuable resource you have. You have created a very valuable resource because people really, I'm very fortunate in the fact that I'm very right brain, left brain. I can separate the two, but not a lot of people have that. So the fact that you can present those to them, I would recommend that anybody go to your site and, and go through some of those videos because they are invaluable. Thank you. My, my philosophy has been very much to, you know, blaze forward, but then leave a trail. There you and go. So that's what I have been trying to do. I've been inspired by some other people who have in the past done blogs and things like that about the journey, their creative journey and stuff like that. Right. Uh, and I, that I've gotten derived great value from. And so that's was my thinking about creating that. And also I've created with the idea that if I were to create like a college level course on creative business, you know, because a lot of professors or whatever are not actually deep in the trenches of, of, you know, doing stuff like that. But I, you know, I, I taught college in the past and I was thinking if I were supposed to teach a class on like creative entrepreneurship today, what type of materials would I need? And so that's kind of what I've been creating to put on that. That's fair. Uh, on that channel. As a, your audience should really take advantage of those. Uh, okay. So like when I was talking well, like, okay, so I was talking with Lou Anders, who is a, a novelist, a fantasy novelist. And I was kind of asking him the same question about, okay, you got this idea. Do you take it to traditional publishing or do you try to go independent? And, you know, what do you need in either way? And we were talking about the importance of social media. And because he was saying, I, you know, I asked him, if you're trying to be a novelist, uh -huh. do, you, do you focus on being a great novelist or do you focus on being great at social media? <laughs> and he said, he said it has to be both. Because say, he says that, it's a toss up. Yeah, yeah, he says he said it has to be both because if you're trying to go the traditional publishing route, people you've got to have a great novel, but then the agents today are going to be looking like, what's your social? You know, how many people are following you? What what are people looking at? And he was like, and if you go the independent route, then it's all about who you know is following you and who knows about what you're doing and stuff like that. So it has to be both. What is that situation like in film? Yeah, you know, I got to tell you, it's really not that different. Um, you know, when it comes, first of all. If your product, if your movie goes through the studio system, number one, um, there's really one of two ways to go. They can distribute the movie that you make independently through their distribu distribution mechanism, or they can buy your product. If you have, if you produce it independently and have them distribute it as a studio, count on $3 million right off the top going to their expenses. So whatever, whatever you plan to recoup, add $3 million to that, right? Mm -hmm. as, and, but it, it's the same for novels to me as it is in film. Do you want to control your own destiny? If you want to control your own destiny, go independent. Because if you go with a studio, if you go with a traditional publishing house, they're going to own your product. They're going to own your copyright unless you're a big name brand author and for you if, you, if you're if you a great author and you're four or five novels in and you're a bestseller on all four, then you can really start changing your terms. But when you're just right out of the box, you know, I had a good friend who was the publisher of Thomas Nelson, Thomas Nelson Publishing. He was the man. And I asked him because, you know, I, I was getting ready to put out my first novel. I said, Dan, is this something I should go through a publisher? He said, Chuck, you know, the a traditional publisher is – someone they're going to look to put a million dollars worth of promotions into. And then you got to recoup that million dollars back before you start seeing real money coming in. Whereas if you do it yourself, you build your following 
that you know I my the second book I wrote was a book on self publishing how to be an independent publishing and the first thing you do as you're writing is you're building your social media audience and you're sending out little snippets and teasing people to get it out there so that when your book finally comes out you've got 120,000 150,000 people out there that you've been working really hard to get really hard to mine those people and you know, you know how hard that is firsthand mm -hmm. uh, something you taught me and so you know but still if I'm if I'm selling my novel through a traditional uh, publishing house, I'm going to see five to seven percent royalty. Putting out my own book, I'm seeing seventy percent royalty, and not only that, but I mean it. And I own it. At the end of the day, if I want to do an audio book, I get to do an audio book. If I want to call it, uh, you know, Tales from the Flip Side. I can call it Tales from the Flip Side. The publisher is not going to come in and go, well, that's a stupid title. Our marketing people think it should be called How to Code from the Flip Side, whatever. And they're going to change the title. You don't have that. Same thing in independent film and independent television. Whether you're YouTube channel, whether you're uh, you know, going out over you know, into theaters. Uh, I just had a friend of mine put out a film. Uh, he spent grand total tax title license, about $750,000, and wound up uh, you know, using some of that 750 to, to do marketing. And he was in 30 theaters in the Southern region. And he did a special release on that uh, Fathom events. And he was in 649 theaters in 49 States. You know, what kind of release are you going to get from a, from a major studio doing that? You're not going to get anything that big from such a small film. So by the time you're looking at doing a, uh, and look, it, 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 alluding to your business side, all right, let's be honest here. When when you're making a film, uh, the film that I just finished writing, it's got a, a preliminary budget of about $20 million. You got to look at the team and say, who on your team is worth 20 million bucks? Do you have a, an actor that's going to garner $20 million at the box office? Do you have, is it a Steven Spielberg type director that people go see because it's him? If you don't have that person, then you're wasting your time trying to get uh, uh, even a $5 million film made through through the studio system. Of, I, I mean, think about it this way. The average budget of a, of a Hollywood studio film is about $100 million bucks. Okay. You, Joe Schmo, who've written a screenplay, your first screenplay, I, the odds of you being able to get a studio convinced to produce your movie at $100 million, even at $20 million, is, is slim to none. And it's not that it can't happen. Okay? Uh, you know, shoot for the moon if you want to shoot for the moon. I mean, I walked into a 7-Eleven in 1983. Uh, and keep right. as a you know uh, kind of lead role in that movie went back over here. See that movie right there? Yeah. All right. I was going to bring that up. You're one of the ones who had luck that yeah. something happened and then you got started. So yeah. So I, I know it happens. I'm not trying to say it doesn't happen, but but if you take the same amount of energy that you're trying to put into getting this this uh, film made at a studio level for even fifty million dollars. If you put that into raising money and doing it yourself, you'll be far more successful. You'll have far more control and you actually have a chance of seeing it happen. And that's what it's all about, right? Because the greatest wishes and thoughts are not going to do you any good if your film never gets made. So there's that. Okay. Well, there are a couple of different ways that I could go off. Actually, let me go this direction because I got, I got two major lines of thought but let me go with this one let right. me rerun some of our thinking or my thinking that it happened over here on this side okay and what's been going on that way we can kind of talk through this sure. because i was um in the company infinite black which is a partnership with uh, a fantasy uh cosmic horror artist david LaRocca, right. and we were developing the intention was to develop a couple of different worlds and he put in his world and i put in my world and we were going to be 50 50 on and so the idea was IP development for, you know, yeah. for these worlds and for uh, different reasons. Like, so, so there, there are a couple of, there are many different ways you could go if you're going to try to develop IP, you mm -hmm. know, for these different fantasy worlds. Um, I had been thinking, well, okay, we need to develop YouTube channels. We need to develop followings for, you know, the different worlds. 
which is no small task, you know, but that, <laughs> no, but, which is no small task. But on the other hand, he was like, okay, do we need to do all of this? Do we need to be doing YouTube channels? Do we do like, let's figure out what we, what pitch materials we need to create. And then let's go straight to a studio and try to just bring it straight to them. So I, then I did research. I even talked to you about, okay, well, if I'm going to do that, what type of materials do I have to create? Yeah. Pitch deck. Um, a pitch deck, uh, some type of um, the, the scissor reel. Yeah, the sizzle reel story. Yeah, the, the sizzle reel of that, that, that. So, you know, and I said, oh, okay, well, that, that's interesting. Like, if you want to, if, if David, if you want to go that route with this world, you know, we got both worlds, you know, at the time, his and mine. Right. Like, well, that's, it would be an interesting thing to try. That we'll try one route with one of them and we'll try the other route with the other one. And David wants to go the, let's just get together the pitch materials and let's just try to go straight to whoever, you know versus trying to do something, I guess I would say organic, you know, in the development of a, a social media and then try to see what happens. Yeah, it's good so those are two yeah. different strategies. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm hesitant. See, my, my thinking was that if you show up, like, let's, let's, let's just say you could do it. Let's just say you show up at Netflix or whatever uh -huh. with, to make your pitch. Uh -huh. You're going to be one of a thousand people with that same pitch. And one of the things that could make you stand out, like one of the things that can make you stand out is not because everybody's, at least in my opinion, or it seems like is to say the, the vision here is, is amazing. The cinematography is going to be this, the story is going to be whatever. But it seems to me, like if you're talking to somebody who's going to give you, you know, supposed to give you $50 million, $70 million, something like that, that actually what they want to hear is I got a hundred thousand people who love this and they want to see this movie. Yeah that that's a more sure so even if you're going to try the i'm i want to go straight to a studio it seems like the most effect it seems like to me because i am not in this world but it seems like the most effective pitches in that direction would be ones that were augmented by a large group of people and social media presence who loved what you were doing yes there has to be you know and you when i say this you're going to go oh my god he's saying it again it's called show business not show art so at the end of the day, it, whether it's a studio investment, whether it's private equity investment, whether, you know, unless unless it's completely crowdfunded, you still, someone's going to look at it and say, okay, how am I getting my money back? How's it coming back to me? Well, you know, we have Denzel Washington in our film and the last three Denzel Washington films grossed, you know, $350 million worldwide or whatever the number is. I don't know if he's, he may be more popular than that. But then they can say, okay, so now we're hedging ourselves against the track record of a Denzel Washington. And that goes back to who's the $20 million guy? Who's the guy that's done films at that level that is going to be responsible with the investor's money? Who's the guy at that level that's made that kind of money back? If you don't have that, then, you know, how do you expect someone to give you that money? You, it, it doesn't have, it's not going to happen. Not going to happen. So this, yeah. you, I, I'll tell you, then, if you don't mind, I, no, I right. was very fortunate enough to have a copy of the pitch deck from Stranger Things. Oh. And I got to tell you, they, they leveraged sci-fi audiences. They took, because their, their show is set in 1986, they took popular shows of the 80s films of the 80s, like Firestarter, like Close Encounters, like E.T., and they looked at them stylistically and kind of broke them down into why they were successful. And then in their pitch deck, they said, this is why our show is going to be successful. Because, you know, and they, they put still frames, still images of E.T., still images of Third Counter and Third, third was it? Close Encounters of the Third Kind. And... That look is exactly the look that Stranger Things has kept for the underneath, the upside down, rather. It's called the upside down, right? That's the exact same look they have for the underneath. So, oh, the upside down, sorry. Um, so it was that compelling pitch deck combined with the fact that of historical value that these, these science fiction films had garnered that got them the deal. Right now, if you had 
um, people attached to it that had never really done anything that, you know, the Duffer brothers had not made other projects before, then the veracity of what they brought to the table would not be as compelling for a studio to say, yes, we have to do that. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's the other thing is you have to have a great pitch deck full of substance, a little bit of sizzle, but full of substance. But then you have to have the people behind the deck to back it up, to say, yes, we've, we've done projects at this level. We've done, we've been successful at this, at this level. Because again, show business, not show art. People want to understand how the money is going to be spent. They want to be comfortable that it's going to be spent properly and that they're going to, at the end of the day, that they have something to put out. Okay, let's talk about um, developing then independent film or web shows or things like that in the context of the broader environment in which we can create it. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because... Of course, doing something independently means doing it yourself, like, you know, all yourself. And that yeah. means all yourself. Sure. And uh, I was talking to Paul Chatto, who is on the Call Me Chatto channel. And he was right. a former, I believe it was CBS executive. Executive, yeah. And, you know, and he's been very interested in, uh, of course, infrastructure and film has a certain meaning, but like I would say infrastructure, but environment that we create for these things. Because, like, for instance, if you do a major stu- movie through a studio, then you can go on Entertainment Tonight. You can send your star Entertainment Tonight for marketing and things like that. Mm-hmm. And so as I've been trying to do these things as well, I've also been aware of, in the different industries, the environment and all of these these ancillary things that exist. Because Are you going to do it yourself or are you going to be existing in some kind of network? Yeah. And it seems to me that the independent film or web show sort of thing is a bit sparse on those kinds of ancillary industries. Like, I don't know what, I think he's right. This is, this is Paul Chatter when he says, I don't know what the independent entertainment tonight is. Right. Right. Well, how do we fix that? Like what, what is that situation and how do we fix that? Well, golly, you know, there's a lot to that. And that's why I said earlier about putting a product out through a, uh, a studio, major studio mechanism, even if you produce it independently. Um, you know, that's, man, that's a deep, that's a deep question. How do I start? Okay. Um, ever hear of a film called Paranormal Activity? Mm-hmm. Okay. How much that film cost to make? Oh, I don't know. $14,995. <laughs> $14,995. Do you think that a, a studio made that film? You know, what a studio did is they found that film at a festival, invested another million dollars into it, beefing up the sound, just like the Blair Witch Project, and wound up putting it out under their banner after buying it from the original creators. Now, if I've got $14,995 into my movie and they say, you know what, we'd like to buy this movie for $10 million, do you think I'm saying no? No, you say it's yours. Where do I sign? Yeah. I right. mean, I it. it's yours. Um, and, and, and this is true. Great product rises to the top. Uh, a good friend of mine, Mark Ilsley, directed a film called Paris, Texas. Uh, or no, I'm sorry. Happy Texas. My bad. And he sent it out to agencies to cast. And he went for sort of the mid-level actors. But it was a really great script. And what his sales agent said, he said, go put it at these agencies. Tell them it's already funded. All right, don't tell them it's not good because they won't take it seriously. But if you tell them you got the money, it'll get into the agency. And next thing you know, he's got, um, oh, what's his name? Well, Allie Walker was in his movie. Um, who's the actor in Shameless? I can see his face. I can't call his name. Bill. Anyway. Famous, famous actors um, got into his movie because they turned the script in and the agencies said, wow, this is a great script and kind of moved it up the ranks until the actors were reading the scripts going, you got to get me in this movie. All right. That's the same thing that happens with Paranormal Activity, with El Mariachi, the first film done by, um, I can't call his name. Um, all these great movies, great product, go to the top of the, the food chain. Right. I can't I'm not saying it can't happen, 
But at the end of at the end of it, and, and look, just the fact. I mean, Fandango. I was I was discovered in a Seven Eleven, and they used that story to leverage you know me getting an article in People Magazine and all that kind of stuff because it was out of the out of the ordinary. Uh, the same thing with Paranormal Activity. This this small independent film shot on home DVD recorder. Um, the same with um, 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 oh Deep Blue Sea, was it? That one of them was the open water. It was open water. Open water. Okay. Shot on on mini DV, and then transfer to film. You know, just those things are enough of a mechanism to get you involved in entertainment tonight and the and the late shows and all those kind of things. That's how that happens for the independent filmmakers. You got to do something different. You got to make a splash. Uh, there's some guys out there, in addition to yourself, that have business um, blogs and things for the film industry. Uh, I think one's called Indie Mogul. Mm -hmm. and he's out there doing doing the same kind of stuff, and he'll he'll say the same thing to you. He'll say the same exact thing. But that's been my experience: is doing small budget films that have some kind of a twist or turn that makes it unique. That's going to get public pub, uh, publicity. But you still, I mean, what's wrong with Facebook? What's wrong with TikTok? What's wrong with Instagram and getting product out there? I mean, you know, YouTube, how many active millions of users does YouTube have every day? Why can't you get out there and drive traffic yourself as an independent producer? Because here's the thing. If I make a film for $10 million, I got to make $10 million back. But if I if I make a film for fifty thousand, I only got to get fifty thousand back. So if you want to be on the big hoity-toity programs, that's your ego talking, right? This is this is this is budget city. If you if you get fifty thousand dollars of investors' money and you bring them back fifty thousand plus plus a little percentage, mm -hmm. you'll make films for the rest of your life mm -hmm. because that's what invest. And, and then every time you just go a little higher, a little higher, you know, next film maybe a hundred, next film maybe half a million. You, you keep setting it up so that you have a path to success and investors will beat the door down to get to you. I, that's well, my experience. can I push back a little bit? Please. And give you an alternate side of that. Okay. Sure, so bro. when you say, you say, hold on. No, go ahead. Oh, okay. So when you say, can you go onto YouTube and drive traffic yourself? Okay. It seems like in a, in a general idea that you could, are you familiar with film threat? Yes. Okay. Okay. So, it, it's it seems when we talked about being an independent producer and that means that you have to do everything yourself yeah. you know it's extremely time consuming and capital intensive but also time consuming to say i'm going to bring out this 10 episode web series or i'm going to bring out this independent movie and you spend a lot of time doing that to the best of your ability right but then when you also look at something like youtube and i've got videos on this where people are talking about what's recommended on youtube and if they're talking about, well, in order to drive YouTube traffic, in order to attract a following, you need to be producing two to three YouTube videos a day, but not more than six, because then the algorithm publishes, you know, punishes right. you. Right. Well, if you're trying to do a show, you can't do three YouTube videos a day. <laughs> right. So, no, that's not happening. So right. if even if you do the best 10 episodes you possibly can, mm -hmm. if the algorithm wants three videos a day, you're not going anywhere. So... Right. You know, one possible answer to that is, OK, well, then that means that not only do you need to produce your five major shows, but you also need to produce all of the what I was calling the entertainment night kind of material, all of your marketing, which might be hundreds of videos. Sure, sure. Uh, so so that would so if somebody just says, well, just go to YouTube and get your own traffic, I would say that's the problem that that's confronting an independent producer. Right. But but you might want to also consider the value add. What's the value add? Well, let's say you've got your uh, um, cultists, right? Mm -hmm. And so you got episodes of your cultists. I think what would help you is to do as many behind the scenes of the cultists and cast side interviews and put those on the channel. Because mm -hmm. if people aren't interested in the cultists, maybe they're interested in the behind the scenes making of a YouTube show. Mm -hmm. You know, so you now you've doubled your opportunity to capture a market uh, and on down. There's a there's a channel and you and I have talked about this channel. It's called Dust mm -hmm. on YouTube. Dust is an aggregator of sci fi oriented short films. And they have, I think, last time I checked about six and a half million subscribers. Mm -hmm. And hundreds and hundreds of shorts. And I subscribe to them just to learn 
what they do well. And I get a notice about one short film every week. Mm. They're putting out one a week. But they're doing things like, you know, when I put my website up, my web host, I got $500 in Google Ads vouchers. You know how much how much play you can get from $500 of Google Ads vouchers? Mm-hmm. Um, when I want to sell a product on my Cajun Cooking Network channel, first thing I put up, I put up a lot of crawfish. <laughs> but once that gets their attention, then, uh, you know, I'm spending – hundred bucks a week on Facebook and I'm getting uh, five figures of people going through my site. Mm-hmm. Now, you, of course you understand the metric. You can drive traffic there. If you don't have anything to keep them there, then that's, you know, that's the other side of the business. And I'll, I'll leave that to you who right. know much more than I do, but you, getting, getting traffic there can be done. It just takes consistency and playing to an audience, finding your audience that's difficult. But once you got them, man, you can play to them. You can play to them real easy. With, uh, with Film Threat, uh-huh. um, uh, I talked to uh, Chris Gore about the cultists. And, you know, and, and he's got, of course, there's the Film Threat website and there's the, the Film Threat YouTube, exa- you know, specifically yeah. the YouTube channel. Sure. And when Paul Chatto was talking about there needs to be an independent entertainment tonight my mind immediately went to that's what film threat should have been the, yeah. you know, film threat was supposed to be an independent kind of thing. And I, when I talked to Chris Gore and I it might be on video or not, he was like, I don't, I don't know what to do with YouTube. I don't know what people are, are looking for because you know, we put stuff up, but that wasn't. And I noticed that he's changed in the past, maybe three or four months. Like they're, they're talking about a lot more, um, mainstream movies like star wars they're talking about star wars and they're talking about you know obi-wan kenobi and stuff like that yeah because i think you know i don't know but you think that okay well they've been trying to get the the film threat youtube channel off the ground and talking about independent film and talking about you know talking to independent viewers that clearly didn't drive it but then they start talking about star wars okay well then now they've got a lot more people coming in and showing up their live shows and stuff like that and, why can't they? Why can't they do the big shows and then do an indie corner, right? Well, I, I still think they're promoting people on on Fridays and things like that. But it to me, it was a uh, looking at what happened because I understand why. If you're trying to grow a YouTube channel, do you want to talk about people's independent films or do you want to talk about Star Wars? Right. Obviously, you talk about Star Wars. Not like, a hard you know, choice. Not a hard right, choice. Right. Not not even a choice. Um, and I've talked to, or I've talked, uh, provided commentary on people's channels when they've been talking about people with large YouTube channels who have been very upset that people are not talking about them. You know, that there be channels who are very critical about the mainstream stuff that's coming out, but yet they don't champion and promote other stuff. And I think there are very good reasons for that, which have to do with human nature and the algorithm and and things like that. Mm -hmm. But I thought that because I really want to talk more with uh, the film threat guys about what's happened that like, it sounds great to say, let's make an independent entertainment tonight, but then do people show up for it? And it might be that they are an example of that. They tried it. And the lesson is no, people don't. Yeah. And it could be, Uh, you know, someone once told me that that was involved with a very big media company said, Chuck, there are a million people out there that like something. You just got to find them. There's a million people out there who want to see stuff about independent production, but you got to get to them. They're not, you know, they're not just laying around for, for the picking. You got to find them. But look, man, it sounds to me like we have an opportunity. If there's no um, independent entertainment tonight, then then we should do one. (laughs) Well, you know, that's what I've, one of the ideas, because when I heard Paul Chatto talk about this, uh-huh. and then I, he had a lot of ideas that I responded to on the Business for Creatives channel because they were more business oriented. Sure. And I know you're in that industry, and I haven't been able to talk to the Film Threat guys again. But, you know, I feel like there's a large number of people out there on, for instance, YouTube specifically, since we're on YouTube, which can be very uh, critical. And of course, that's completely valid. It's completely valid. I don't want to invalidate it at all because you can completely say I'm going to be a critic of mainstream stuff and, you know, potentially not like names, mainstream stuff, you know, and be critical. Oh, did I lose Chuck? 
Uh oh. <laughs> oh, okay. No, no, there. Okay, there you go. I'm sorry. I thought I lost you for a second. But I was going to say that you could be critical of mainstream stuff, and there's no problem with that. And there are a lot of people who have managed to create uh, very large audiences based on that. And yeah. that's, of course, if you are creating a critique channel, then I mean, more power to you. That is fantastic. Uh, you know, uh, I salute you. But there seems to be enough people who have noticed that we need something that is also constructive. I, I made a mistake uh, when I was talking to some people and said something about we need to be positive, but I actually didn't mean positive. Excuse me. Um, because, you know, if you watch something and you don't like it, then by all means, be negative. But I'm somebody who is creating stuff. You're somebody who's creating stuff. There are other people who are creating stuff. So I think the better word is constructive. We should be constructive uh, to positive to to create the things that we want to create, rather than just being negative about the stuff that we don't like. Yes. Well, you uh, Heath, I think you'll find that the people who are negative are no talent slouches who feel like you know people that are doing better than you don't criticize what you do. People who are working harder and doing better things don't criticize people who are just trying. It's the people who don't do it who who have issues. It's me. It's easier to just be a troll than it is to say, "Hey, man, you know, liked your story, but you know, I didn't didn't like your choice of of the lead actress. She there was there was really no chemistry. You know, yeah. next time try this. No, nobody has the 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 intestinal fortitude, the the chutzpah to step up and say, you know, hey. Try this, man. I, you know, I liked your stuff. Everybody's like, ah, you know, it's like TikTok. Oh, you're fat. You know, you, you know, this, this, this beautiful girl. Oh, you're fat. You're too old. You should never be on the channel. Well, that's, you know, anybody can be a troll. It takes a human being with intelligence to be a, a good, a good constructive critic. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't want, I don't want to write off. I wasn't talking about people who were critical of me specifically, because I don't want to write off that group as like no talent or just trolls because you can produce a YouTube show. That's of incredible high quality that people love that happens to be critical of mainstream stuff. Yeah. Like, so that's, that's wonderful. And so when you say, here's an independent show, they're just like, legitimately, we don't look at that because we've got an audience. They want to hear how we don't like star Wars and star Trek. So all of our videos that we've got to produce are about how we don't like star Wars and star Trek. And right. so there, there's something, the algorithm, human nature, the audience, what people expect. So, you know, as far as they could be incredibly talented about creating a critique show. Right. But at the end, but that doesn't drive new stuff. So it may, it may have to be something separate. It may have to be something different. Uh, because because I understand that if you develop an audience who is looking for you about how you don't like Star Wars, you don't like Marvel or something like that, and then you turn around the next video that you put out is how much I like this independent show, right. that your audience will react negatively to that, yeah, and they'll right. even leave. So yeah. I understand why there are reasons why they can't do that. That's why I'm not critical of them specifically. I'm critical of the system that we're in and how do we systematically break that like, like what do we need to do in order to actually facilitate that ecosystem that paul chato was talking about for independent productions does that make sense yes it does it does and you know i i think he that is something that you certainly would have i think a big part in because in my mind you really kind of went after and broke the mold in crowdfunding for your board games i really think you went out and and thought a little bit outside of the box um the, the answer is use the mechanism for what the mechanism is good for. Mm. You know, we, we do a lot of um, branded entertainment shows for people like Discovery and that kind of stuff. And we put our stuff on their network. We pay to be on their network because they're good at gathering eyeballs, but they're not good at budgeting a show. You know, I can do a show for $60,000 that they would take 300000 to do. Because that's, you know, that's kind of their mechanism. That's where they make part of their money. So if we're, if we're using uh, um, branded people, like uh, in a car show that we did, we had Wildwood Brakes was one of our sponsors. We used their product on the show. We had an allowance we got from them. But we owned the show at the end of the day. So the, 
what the channels were good for was eyeballs. They weren't good for production. In the same way, yeah, you know, you need to use the mechanisms that are good for you. If it's YouTube or what have you, use that mechanism in a way that mechanism, don't try to make that mechanism do something it doesn't do, you know? So that's just kind of my thinking. And the other, by the way, the name I could remember the actor was William H. Macy. <laughs> oh, oh, I love him. Okay. Yeah, I was, I was stuck in that. I'm calling him Bill because, you know, it's, but his, his actor name, William H. Macy. Um, you know, and another thing is, you know, YouTube responds well to product that you put uploading, shows that you're uploading, but they're also very big on promoting driving traffic to your YouTube. So the more traffic you drive, the more they move you up in the in the algorithm, mm -hmm. um, which is something for your audience to consider. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, and you know, what I've been trying to do here, you know, on, on this channel, we've got the creative side of things, but I didn't because there was like a whole flame war and stuff like that, which is what I was kind of the people who have, who are the critical side. And the people are saying that like, you don't promote anything. I mean, you talk about how much you hate stuff, but you don't talk about, you know, here's which. So here on this channel, at least we're trying to be constructive talking to you who are doing independent things. I'm talking to other people, you know, Tuesdays and on Thursdays on, on this about people who are, are creating things uh, independent people on Sundays when we're doing the general geekdom show. I didn't want that to happen over here. Uh -huh. that, that here, uh, I, I'm a very, I'm also a believer in not only leaving the trail, but taking people with you. Yeah. That, you know, if, if you're going, you can't do it alone. Nope. So you take all these people with you yep. uh, and you find out who was kind of at your level and then you all go. Right. And, you know, nothing would make me happier like absolutely completely literally i mean nothing would make me happier is if i got to the end of my journey and there were a dozen two dozen whatever of the core people who had been part of this who were also had every bit of success that they had wanted at the end of the journey too i, sure. mean, I want to take people with me and i want to bring oh, people man. up behind that's the stuff man that's the stuff that's the marrow of life mm -hmm. it, it is that's uh so hopefully it it, it as, as we go, because like I said, I, if we're thinking about that and if there are a group of people who are thinking about the ecosystem, let's find that network. Sure. You know, th that supports that. I, I think that's I think that's really important. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, you can find it or you can start it. You can nudge it. Um, you know, I have a guy here in town who's trying to build a virtual studio meaning that it doesn't exist anywhere, but it exists everywhere. So okay. he's, he's working toward that with different different folks in different phases of filmmaking, being able to, uh, you know, art directors or what have you, uh, editors, colorists, that can be anywhere in the world. You know, we do some stuff now with uh, some folks in Korea, uh, just because a friend, and a friend of mine just uh, opened a... Um, Visual effects studio, I think in I want to say Cambodia. You know, labor's very inexpensive. The artisans are very trained, very focused, and they get everything from high speed internet and done. Mm -hmm. So that can, that can happen. It's amazing what happens when people of like mind put their egos down and help other people. And that should be what the internet's facilitating. Like when the internet is its best, that's what it's, it's it should be facilitating. Yep. Uh, would you like to tell everybody, because uh, we're, we're coming up on an hour here, but would you like to tell everybody where they can find you on social media and what your, your current materials are and things like that? Because I do have the links down below, but you want to tell everybody where they can find you? Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm on Facebook, Chuck.Bush.247 on Facebook. Um, my Visual effects production company is Audacious Effects, which is at Audacious Effects on Facebook. Um, you know, or, but I mean, if anyone wants to reach out, welcome everybody that wants to reach out. Hit the links, but also, you know, ping Keith, Heath, not Keith, ping Heath. And, uh, you know, he'll, he'll connect us because, you know, anything that comes through the show, I'd like him to, to be a part of it. I mean, he's, he's somebody who's worthwhile working with. Thank you so much for being here with me tonight. I think this was a very important and productive conversation. Thank you. I'm, I'm a, so hacked, man. I appreciate you having a, a constructive conversation. And that's the kind of thing that I like doing here. A constructive conversation for people who are interested in the, the creative and business side of, of trying to make something happen in today's yeah. world. So hopefully. <laughs>
All right. Thank you, everybody. We are out of here. Yes, thank you. Appreciate you having me.